John? Yeah, the sponsor of today's video is AudioQuest. Click the link in the description box below. Bye. Recently we made a video about the Sonus Faber Lumina 2 loudspeakers and very often during the review process, the listening that you don't see, I get to experiment with a lot of different combinations of electronics that feed our loudspeakers, sometimes more than others. But with the Sonus Faber I went on a bit of a journey through different bits of hardware working out which I think would be the, the subjectively best, which is a word I hate, but the kind of best combinations and not just best sound, but also price has to be a factor here, right? We can't be putting a $16,000 molar molar cooler amp with these because they sell for 1100 euros. It's never gonna work that way. So, before I explain the kind of stuff that I found out, I just want to recap on the main characteristics of the Lumina 2. Firstly, they're not a bass weighty speaker. Obviously, they're a small stand mount, but they're not even one of those stand mount that surprises everybody with how much bass they put out. Secondly, they have quite an exciting upper mid range. There's a bit of a, just a little bit of a push on that, which I think really yeah, makes listening to music a front of the, the listening chair experience. It makes it a lean in kind of speaker. And thirdly, adding to that excitement, microdynamics, and less so macrodynamics, but microdynamics are very, very good for this stand mount. So even though the Lumina 2's tweeter is, I guess it's not necessarily lively, but it's livelier than some other speakers like the LS50 Meta, which are here. Even though that's the case, they don't, they don't annoy or agitate or grate or don't make you wince. But that, I guess, is really determined by the amplifier and to a lesser extent, the source electronics that we use further up the chain. Because the tweeter on the Lumina 2 really tell us a lot about our electronics. So I started out listening to Humanoids 7 Songs EP, which is basically Acid House. I was playing it on the debut Pro from Project. I made a video about that recently. And I started out with the shit Manny phono stage. And I was listening and just thinking, yeah, this is okay, but there's just a little bit of too much tension in the whole scene. So I swapped out the Manny for the Wired for Sound PH1, which is a much more expensive phono stage. And I just, instantly, you just like, your shoulders relax, even though the Humanoid's Acid House is very intense electronic music, you just relax a little bit more. So even though you're kind of on the edge of your seat, it's not the extreme tension that a lesser phono stage brings. And I think, personally, I think that's really interesting. Because it, th those differences between phono stages are more pronounced with these loudspeakers than I've heard with other speakers, or certainly that I can remember hearing, because I guess really I'm drawing on audio memory a little bit and that's not very reliable. But before I got to the whole phono stage thing, I was experimenting with amplifiers. And I thought I would try a price appropriate pair of amplifiers, two of them. I've got two of the shit Agir monoblocks, which are rated 80 watts per channel into eight ohms. I did email shit and, and ask them, am I okay using these into four ohms? And Jason Stoddard, who designed the amplifier, said, you should be fine. The worst that will happen is that they'll go into shutdown. They didn't go into shutdown, not at all. But again, they did sound a little bit, just a little bit edgy. And I'm wondering 
if there wasn't quite enough power being dispatched to the Sonos Faber loudspeaker and therefore its tweeter. Again, I'm just guessing here. And that's interesting because Sonos Faber suggests that we should be using an amplifier with an output of between 30 watts per channel and 150 watts per channel. So even though we had enough watts, maybe we, maybe there wasn't enough current delivery, I don't know. But it just didn't seem to, here's a, an audiophile buzzword, didn't seem to synergize. Audiophiles love to talk about synergy between components. So with the Aegea really kind of out of the picture, I look to my Vidar, but the thing is I don't have two. And I'm running a whole bunch of electronics along here using the Freya Plus preamp balanced out. And you can only connect the Freya to the Vidar with balance when you have two of them. So I, I couldn't use that. So then I cut over to the Peachtree GAN 400 which is a $3,000 power amplifier, which is much more expensive. And it sounded beautiful and wonderfully extended and large and sort of that big majestic sound. But I don't think this is a good pairing with the Sonus Faber because you've got a three grand power amp driving an 1100 euro pair of speakers. I think many people would balk at that, especially when you have to add in a preamp as well and then phono stage and DAC thereafter. So. I didn't think that was a good match just purely from a, a financial point of view. But what was really interesting after that is that I moved over to the MyTech Brooklyn amp and it's sort of darker, more hooded top end, I think was a better sonic fit for these Sonus Faber than the Peachtree, even though I think the Peachtree is the better amp. But in this particular case, the better amp doesn't always win out because I think the MyTech sort of more hooded top end just sort of played a nice counterbalance to the Sonus Faber's more lively disposition. After the MyTech, I thought, no, I really need to kind of bring it back down to earth, back to a more kind of sane price point. I pulled out my NAD C316BEE and I hooked in a Blue Sound node network streamer. So I got a whole setup for what, 900 euros? And that is a price appropriate fit for these Sonus Faber speakers. And what I like about the NAD is it's plenty punchy, it's dynamic. The thing is, compared to the more expensive amps, it's just a little bit hooded, but also it lacks clarity as well as being hooded, whereas the MyTech has the, the clarity. The NAD with the Blue Sound No doesn't really have the clarity of more expensive propositions. So this is a lesson in you kind of get what you pay for and you don't get what you don't pay for. But if you ask me, would I recommend <laughs> using the NAD and the, and the Blue Sound node with the Lumina 2? Well, yeah, it's a great starting point and it would hold you over until you could afford something better. And that better was really best in this little investigation for me. And that was the name Unity Atom. And this pairing, so the name Unity Atom with the Sonus Faber Lumina 2 reminded me of an interview I saw many years ago with David Lynch. And David Lynch had this thing where he would talk about the eye of the duck scene in a movie. And what he meant by that was, if you look at the eye on a duck, if you move it at all, you know, metaphorically or with Photoshop, it makes the duck look completely out of whack. And so if that scene doesn't exist as it does in a movie, it kind of sets the whole movie off balance. Conversely, if the eye of the duck is in exactly the right place, everything sort of, everything just sort of pulls together and everything really kind of just almost locks into place. And I had this experience with the name Unity Atom and the Sun's Father. I just thought this is just a wonderful combination. I've got all the extension I want. I don't have too much glare or there's no wince factor, but equally it's not hooded or rolled off. It just sounded just right, eye of the duck. 
And I also therefore wondered, is this because inside the Atom is the streamer, the DAC, plus the amp, so the whole thing designed by one manufacturer. So they've worked out all the sort of internal synergies, if you like, between those components that would otherwise be separates and put them all into one box. And it's a shoe box with, I've got to say, the world's best volume control. It really is, it's wonderful. And then you have that, or I have that on my sideboard. So one streaming amplifier plus a pair of speakers, nothing else, it looks wonderfully minimal. So it ticks all the aesthetic boxes as well. It's eye of the duck aesthetic. I just think that <laughs> it's just so wonderful. Like the sound that comes out of that combination, it's just, it's just I won't say it's perfect, but it's just so satisfying that I really, well, I don't really want to try anything else, but I have to, because some of you will be thinking, but John, what about the Cambridge Audio Evo 150? Well, that's coming next. Anyway, sometimes, you know, my work involves a bit of a journey, and I've just sort of detailed that today so you understand some of the work that goes on in the background, aside from filming and editing, which just eats most of the time, actually. But if you appreciate this more rambly video, because I did ramble a bit, then please give it a like down below if you like my attitude towards high-end audio in that I value experience over theorizing. I like to try and do things, plug this in, try this out, you know, make a value judgment and then try something else. If you dig that, then please subscribe to this channel. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching.